So I've, I've technically started recording, but I think I should probably introduce who you are to the people watching this current video. You are Henry sure. Garrity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That I got, is that me. Out. <laughs> got that out of the way. Got that out of the way. Yeah. So talk to me about the season that you've been working. What have, what have you been up to? What has that entailed exactly? I'm a dog musher. I work with sled dogs. I kind of take care of their individual health and needs. And I go on rides through the back country in Northern Wyoming mm. with guests. I take them on like a, you know, 12 to 16 mile dog sled ride through the woods and kind of show them a bit about the tradition. And I just get to basically spend time in the wilderness and it's, it's pretty nice. I've, I've really loved it. Yeah. It's been good. That sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's, it's been great. It's, it's going to be hard to say goodbye to the dogs that I've been working with, you know, that's going to sure. be the hardest thing. <laughs> sure. So how did, how did this opportunity come about? Is this something you've done before or was this kind of a new venture for you? It's new in a lot of ways. I've been working with dogs for a long time though, in and out of dog rescue kennels, especially. One day, a few years ago, I just was looking for a change. I Google searched cool jobs with dogs <laughs> and I found a position as a handler for a, a sled dog company. And I just kind of took it. I moved out to Juneau, Alaska, and it was amazing out there. And then this past summer with COVID, I just thought I can't really play shows anymore. So might as well make the most of kind of an, an unfortunate situation and get back into at least doing something like this where I'm working outside every day. I'm in a really interesting place doing something different and new. So that's totally. kind of where I was going. I am rather envious of the fact that you're not necessarily cooped up in a small Brooklyn apartment. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only imagine what you must have been going through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you posted back when I think you were just heading out to Wyoming, you posted on your Instagram because I was going through your social media feeds prior to this interview. You got to prepare. Sure. You got to yeah. prepare, you know. And the last post on your Instagram was saying, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm living in Wyoming as a dog musher, which came out of the blue um <laughs> yeah, a little bit and then you said expect to see lots more dog related content from me as usual yeah and then i just kind of didn't didn't you, post anything you didn't there. post anything about dogs i just don't really like instagram i don't really like facebook mm. it stresses me out creating and curating like content of my life every time i think about doing it I just kind of have this like impulse not to do it instead. So sure. I kind of didn't own up to, I, I probably still could. I've got lots of content I could post on there any day now, but every time I think about it, I'm just like, eh, no. Yeah. I like certain things just being mine, certain experiences and just owning them and not, I guess I'm a pretty private person with that stuff, which is something that I, I battle with and like trying to also promote myself. It's kind of a weird balance there. Totally. For sure. Totally. I don't necessarily blame you. I don't want to, I'm not going to give you a hard time. No, no, it's okay. Dog can, photos. <laughs> but yeah, social media is definitely, especially as we are both freelance musicians from time to time, there is definitely a pressure on us to be our own promotional team as well as our own artist. Yeah, it's, it, it's certainly not something that comes naturally to me. It's not an inclination I have to just like put everything out into the world. But it's totally just a difficult balance that you kind of have to come to terms yeah, with nowadays. Definitely. Yeah. How did you like Wyoming? It's a beautiful state. It's weird. It's um, probably one of the coolest states in the country in terms of just the natural beauty, things that you can see. The very conservative stance the state has, I think, mm. weirdly kind of insulates it from people wanting to come in and visit. Sure. So... You almost feel like you're in this state that's like a well-kept secret, even though it's probably just as cool as states like Colorado, if not cooler. It's just a beautiful place. I feel like I haven't seen enough of it almost. There's mm. so much to see and do out here, just going on hikes, camping. It really is quite an amazing spot. It's kind of interesting dealing with like, I don't know, just different types of people than I would normally deal with back at home in Chicago. There's just like a totally different mindset about everything. Yeah. Everybody is like, they, they kind of take things a season at a time. You know, they don't necessarily have like a five, 10 year plan. They just kind of are living their lives from their perspective of like, this is what I'm doing this year. 
and it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens after this. You know what I mean? It's very sure. like, it's interesting. It's just different. I love mm. that. Yeah. I like getting a chance to see different stuff and experiencing different kinds of people. Totally. I love Wyoming a lot. I've never gone in the winter. I've never, I've never seen it in the season that you've most recently seen it. Both the times I went were in the summer and it might be my favorite state, especially as far as like, like you were saying, natural splendor goes. Cause the first time I was, I went to Wyoming, it was on a road trip actually back from Lawrence. My dad came out, I think the end of my freshman year and we road tripped back to California. We left Wisconsin, went through Minnesota, traversed South Dakota and kind of wound up in the Badlands in the Western mm -hmm. part of the state. And then it's almost like, in my mind, it's almost like we crossed the state line into Wyoming and all of a sudden like the earth was really red and the grass was super green. And it was like, I'd wound up on this, like a different planet almost, especially compared to the Badlands that I had just seen like the day before. I'm going to see Devil's Tower, going to oh, see yeah. the Tetons, hanging out in Jackson a little bit. 10 out of 10 would recommend as far as like a, a, a natural splendor thing goes. But I do definitely get this. I mean, it's one of the least densely populated states. I feel like it's in that way, kind of Alaska light, where if you kind of want to get away, especially if you're kind of a more privately minded individual, there's definitely an allure to being surrounded by nature and having neighbors like way far away and just having a lot of kind of space to yourself. Yeah, there just isn't very much infrastructure in a majority of the state. It's all very like, yeah, you're right. Like if you come out here and you decide to buy land, live here, you're kind of on your own. You really mm -hmm. are in a lot of ways. You gotta, it's just different. It's different from what I'm used to, which is, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a good, a good kind of refresher in a way. Yeah. 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 Have you been able to make any music while you've been there or have you been kind of busy with the dogs? The job has been very busy, time intensive. I just get two days off a month while I work up here. And wow. every other day, pretty much doing two tours a day, working from like eight to, to five, six o'clock PM. So, but that being said, yeah, I've, I've had some time to just kind of noodle around and play around. I've got some new instruments that I bought recently that are really fun. That's been fun to learn. Like I'm learning how to play the saw right now. <laughs> oh, that's cool. cool. It's really hard. I don't oh, get yeah. it, but it's a lot of fun. I got a harmonium as well, cool. which is just this like, oh, just the sound and texture. I've been trying to work on sampling that a lot and just kind of making collage music just from the different like qualities of sound you can get from an instrument like that. Hmm. So a lot of experimenting and noodling around. Not too many opportunities to play shows, of course. Of course. Which, which I miss dearly. I would probably give up like one of my toes to play a live show again in the near future. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, what, what toe? Oh, whichever, any toe. It would be a random choice. There's, there's some toes I think that are more integral to balance than others. Of course. Yeah. Like, even though we may think the pinky toe isn't really doing much, <laughs> it's keeping us from falling either, either way. So I'd probably yeah. go somewhere, something in the middle, like a, a middle <laughs> toe. It's probably fine. Sure. I'd probably, yeah, I'm just saying that I'd be willing to, to roll the dice, so to speak, whichever toe wow. it takes. Dang, that is, that is commitment. Yeah. I've definitely, I've definitely been itching to get back out there because, so when I went to Lawrence, I went in as a classical composer. That was the thing that I did. And mm -hmm. I would write songs, but it was very much kind of on the side for fun when I had a little bit of spare time. And when it came to playing my songs in, like in public in concert kind of situations, um, I didn't really go after those opportunities because that wasn't kind of what I did. I think as time has gone on and especially kind of during my masters, how I kind of think of myself as a musician has changed. And hmm. I had had an experience at uh, my graduate school at Stony Brook where I'd played a recital of a bunch of my songs and like the reaction was really positive. And like, you write a new classical music piece and it's performed at a recital and everything's like, oh, very nice. I liked what you did with the timbre of the blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then I would like play some of my songs and people would be like, oh my God, I love that. Yes. Oh. It was just such a yeah. much more enthusiastic response. 
And I really thought, geez, you know, people seem to like these things. I should like actually get starting to perform them more. And when I moved into the city, I like actually sought out opportunities to perform. And things that like the ball had just started rolling. Like it had, it had rolled like a quarter of the way around and then things stopped. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to pick those pieces up, reach out to those places and be like, hey, remember me from a year ago? Keep me in mind, I'd like to do things one of these days. Yeah. So I feel that. So are you coming back to Chicago pretty soon or are you staying out there a little longer? Yeah, for at least a little while. I've got, I'd like to start recording music again, honestly, is the biggest draw for me to get back to Chicago. I know lots of really talented audio engineers that I've worked with in the past in the city. Mm. So there's kind of this established network already and that's kind of enticing. So I can just like go back there and just jump right back in. Yeah. And just do that whole thing. Part of it also is playing it by ear just because it seems like with COVID there's a soft end date to the precautions that we're taking right now. And it's kind of unclear as to when exactly we'll be able to start safely playing live performances and indoor venues soon. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of uncertainty still, and I'm definitely like playing it by ear a a little bit, I guess. Sure. You know, it seems like every week things change a little bit more, right? So I think for at least a little while, I'd love to move to Chicago to at least start working on some of my own projects again with more like intention. Sure. And then after that, it's just kind of like, who knows whenever that process is done. Yeah. Yeah. It's a a great city. I love Chicago. It's really nice. I I do miss it. And especially, I think, given our Lawrence connection, a lot of people we know either went to Minneapolis or went to Chicago. Yeah, Um, for sure. And so there's definitely like a bunch of people that I collaborated with on this particular album are in the Chicago area, including uh, Jason and Sam, who both worked on the the track that you played some guitar on. And we're, I think we're kind of trying to do some projects going forward where we're virtually recording stuff. But it's definitely, you know, I like New York. I'd like to try to have a swing at things here, but there are definitely moments where I'm like, oh, I'd really like to work with so-and-so. Oh, they're in Chicago. Okay. And then maybe I could, <laughs> I could collaborate with this guy. Oh, Chicago. Yeah, Chicago as well. So there's definitely, <laughs> if I don't wind up relocating here, I'll definitely be kind of traveling back and forth. I can, I can see that happening. For sure. Yeah. Now I got to know you at Lawrence as a flute player mm-hmm. or a flautist as the correct term. Everyone out there, the term is flautist. That's the term that every <laughs> flute player likes. And that's what you should call them. Just a little... <laughs> a little announcement there um no, thanks for that yeah and you were playing one of my weird compositions which is a bunch of air noises and extended technique things so tell me just kind of walk me through because i'm all, i'm always interested in how people come into school and how they wind up leaving like did you come how what was your mindset coming into lawrence and how, did that change over time totally yeah i think Honestly, I walked into Lawrence University into that secondary education, just not really like having a clear idea of what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that I loved to play music and that I loved playing like contemporary music, especially with the flute. So I figured that was something to go off of, but it was really just jumping off into the deep end. (laughs) And there was a lot of adjusting and just growing as an adult that I needed to do uh, as I made my way through college. In terms of like music, I began to notice that like my interest in like the classical world weren't as just wasn't as deep or as sincere as it really needed to be in order for me to like actually make a career out of something in in flute performance. So I started sinking more and more into like different types of musical performance, writing more just, you know, pop songs, folk songs, Mm -hmm. singing, started using a lot of loop pedals and loop devices in, in college as well. So I guess there was a slow transformation from living in this more like established classical tradition and kind Mm. of dipping my toes into something different as uh, my four years went on there. Sure. Yeah, I guess that's, that's basically what went down. (laughs) Yeah. More or less. Yeah. (laughs) So what did you wind up majoring in by the end of it all? I started in flute performance, but then I ended up just majoring in music with, uh, with the focus in, in flute which was a lot nicer because that allowed me to like take more classes outside of the conservatory so I could just learn different things. Sure. Which was nice. 
I am a, a fan of your songwriting. I think it's fair to say. Where can people find the, the music that you make? You know, on Spotify, I think on any streaming service, just look up my name, Henry William Garrity, I think is how you find it on Spotify. And then I have okay. a band camp that's just under my name as well. And then of course, you know, Facebook, all that stuff. And I do have an Instagram that I, I use very sporadically. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there are links that takes you to all the websites, right? So yeah, that's how you can find me as well. Great. This is the first album that I'm like doing the whole Spotify streaming service, like sending it out places thing. Yeah. Um, Cause usually I just slap it up on Bandcamp and it's fine. And I don't have to think about it. It's really, it's just such an easy platform to use. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. I, I've gone through like making physical CDs and then the CD place is going to contact CD baby, which I think handles the more digital distribution stuff. So that's, that's a brand new world to me. Yeah. Inside. CD baby is a pretty solid service to use. Mm. I, everybody I've heard says good things about it. They'll get you like on a, on a bunch of weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> just take care of it all. It's kind of weird. You'll like stumble across your songs and stuff in places that you never would have thought that mm. it could be placed, you know? So, sure. 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 Yeah. Uh, just in case people watching the video are hearing clarinet in the background of my <laughs> audio, I do live in an apartment with other musicians. So that is, that is what you're hearing. Have you been living kind of in your own place? Yeah, been I've been I've been living in uh, basically a 120 year old single room cabin with three other boys. Oh, okay. <laughs> we got a room separated by bed sheets. It's kind <laughs> of like I'm pretty sure it's maybe like a condemned building, but we've got power, we've got heat, we don't have running water. Oh, Squirrels kind of try to mess with our our clothes, and sometimes they'll try to get at my instruments and stuff. So it, it's it's been interesting, but that Whoa. being said, you'd be surprised like what you can get used to in terms of living situations. Like sure, a lot of the things that I thought that I really needed, like living in Chicago, uh, a lot of those like I don't know, I guess you call them necessities. I realized were actually like I could actually I don't necessarily need to have easy access to like a shower, hmm. stuff like that, twenty four seven, or even having access to like the internet. Sure, it was a little jarring, but you get used to it pretty quick after like you know ten days. You're like okay. Is the new yeah. thing. Well, I also imagine like as busy as you've been with your with your job. The reason I'm online so much is I got nothing like schedule wise going on. So if there's any, if there's just like spare time, I'm like, well, I might as well just go on and check stuff. But imagine that the impulse is also somewhat abated by you running around and doing all these tours. Yeah, for sure. Having a really busy schedule, having like really strict structure. Yeah, there are definitely times where you can't even think about it, for mm. sure. And that that helps a lot. There are days where, I, yeah, I don't even notice it for that reason. It's also why I probably haven't been very active on social media, honestly. I'm just like, <laughs> I got got stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I got to scoop dog poop and check their nails and just make sure that they're doing okay. And yeah. I guess also if you're, Good point. I guess if you're also like on a tour, you don't want to like, stop in the middle and be like, okay, guys, I just got to get a picture for my Instagram. So smile. And then like, get, I got to take some close ups of the dogs and I was like, all right, now we can keep going. That uh, wouldn't be great. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely is like, definitely wouldn't help things, I guess. Sure. How, so with the, with the people who go on these tours, are there ever any people who are like just doing it for the gram? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Definitely, I've taken people out on tours that, you know, people just come to, they're on vacation brain, they're just looking for stuff to do, and they ask the hotel concierge, like, what are some things that I can sign up for, and they'll just tell you, like, well, dog sledding, and they're like, oh, that would be so great for Instagram, Yeah, and maybe they don't even like dogs, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely noticed that, that vibe. For the most part, though, I mean, the ride that we do out here is pretty sweet, and I think most people come in. And they're just totally blown away by what we do out here because it is sure. pretty special. Again, it's Wyoming, right? It's hard to hard to beat. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, dogs do well, I'm, I think, with the algorithms. So I, I, I can <laughs> see that that would be a... More than ever, people love dogs. It's, yeah. it's crazy what's been going on culturally with that. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's one of the few things we can give a hug. 
Yeah. So that's that's I mean, definitely changed things. From my perspective, working in Chicago and at this dog rescue kennel called uh, Chicago Canine Rescue, there were some days where like we practically didn't have any dogs in our facility that needed to find homes, like especially hmm. with COVID, you know, the dog adoption rate has just been crazy. Sure. One of the silver linings, I guess. Yeah, we there was a point where my roommate and I talked about potentially doing that. It seemed like a nice thing to do, but also like our apartment doesn't allow, allow pets. So we'd have to be like real sneaky about it. The The neighbors downstairs might hear a lot of clickety clacketing going on. And I think, I feel like the amount of parties people in this apartment building have had, I feel- Oh yeah? Oh my goodness. Yeah, it seems like we we try to look on the bright side and think, well, maybe they're just, it's, maybe it's just the roommates just having a good time together safely in their little pod but no they're no they're inviting people over so in some respect i feel like no matter what we did in our apartment we probably wouldn't get very many complaints there was a while there i think it's gotten better but there was a while there especially so i moved into this room after one of our roommates left out because it's kind of a larger room but the downside is that it shares a wall with the next door neighbors and shortly after our roommate moved out a new group of people moved into the apartment opposite. And there are young kiddos. They're like in their early 20s, like children. I think they make beats or something. I, I shouldn't be talking this loud, I suppose, since they're right over there. But they, they make a lot of noise, music that I don't find very appealing, kind of looped bass lines over and over. But the kind of the flip side of that is there was a while there where it was just me in the apartment and I could like play music at two in the morning, three, just like playing the piano, singing along with absolute impunity because I knew that they didn't have a leg to stand on if they were gonna <laughs> criticize the noise. Like he's playing at three in the morning, like they were playing until three and four and this crazy time. Yeah. So looking back, I think if we had gotten a dog, there would have been no issue as far as the other apartments went but then there would be the whole thing also financially of like well we'd have to get food and things like that and get the necessary supplies to take care of to take care of the dog and it was at a time when financially things were a little up in the air shall we say <laughs> yeah uh yeah so we wound up not going through with that but it's, it's a very worthwhile thing to do if your apartment allows it mm -hmm. i don't want anyone watching this video and rushing out and getting a dog and it violates their lease and then they go well david David said it was a good thing to do, so I rushed out and did it. So, disclaimer. For sure, yeah. It's not yeah. for everyone. I mean, uh, dogs are they're nuts. They're kind of gross. They like to eat <laughs> gross things and, and do gross things, and they've got pretty big emotional needs. Yeah. Especially if, you know, especially if it's a rescue dog. Sometimes you don't necessarily know what that dog's been through. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there can be behaviors that confuse you. We had a a dog for for a good long while who was a rescue and didn't like guys in hats if you were wearing a hat that was not okay he would freak out same with backpacks i think there's something about backpacks and if you went up a ladder it, he, it would blow his mind he wouldn't know what to really? do himself oh yeah you'd start going up a ladder onto the roof and it was like it was like you just started flying huh? like the way he reacted was just like jumping around and like trying to come up the ladder and like crazy and there was one time i remember there was one time um, my parents live right next to a big park and mm -hmm. it must have been sometime in the winter or the spring and there had been some heavy rainfall and so they put a sign in the middle of one of the fields saying like hey don't use this field for sporting activities it's really wet and muddy and stuff and they put the sign had a little red stop sign logo on it and we were we were on a walk in the park and he saw this this stop sign in the field and just lost it. He was barking at it, like he was angry about something. I don't know exactly what that was all about. But yes, I think getting a rescue dog is kind of exciting because you never you never really know what you're gonna wind up with. Definitely. Yeah. Did you grow up with dogs? Not really. My parents got a dog when I was like 13, a rescue beagle, really sweet dog. And I don't know, like I just kind of fell into working with animals after I graduated from, from college. It was kind mm. of a good side gig at the time to help, you know, facilitate my music playing. 
Sure. But I think eventually it's just the more time you spend around animals that are very loving and empathetic, you just can't help but grow to like them and, and understand them more. Hmm. So I think over time, I just wormed my way in there. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. It's like, <laughs> I was just open to, to something that I didn't necessarily have planned, I guess, when I mm. really started getting serious about working with dogs. I was like, oh, I, I kind of really like working with these animals. Like, I didn't expect that. And then I just kind of let that grow into kind of a passion of its own, which in a lot of ways is very, it competes with music, I think, because especially working with sled dogs, um, it's just such a time intensive job. So mm. kind of hard to do both at the same time. So in an interesting way, it's been kind of, Competing passions, I guess you could say. Sure. Is yeah, what it's been that. lately. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, kind of going hand in hand with your songwriting, I always enjoyed your Facebook statuses, which were very poetical and kind of, what's the word? Very whimsical. So I, I hope you're still kind of writing some little po poem things because I did enjoy that aspect of your social media output. I, I was a particular fan of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I love to write prose every mm -hmm. once in a while, for sure. Got a little journal. I guess that's become more of like private thing lately, but mm -hmm. maybe I should probably start releasing some stuff like that again. It's always fun, right? Yeah. To have fun with social media like that, be a little whimsical with it. Yeah, I remember there was one one Facebook status you wrote, and I, I think I reached out to you. I was like, can I use this as text in a composition? The composition wound up not being good. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a composition that I would willingly share to anyone. You could, fi you could find it. It's like still, it was for a music festival. Oh, cool. The music festival posted the video of it on their YouTube channel. So it's like, I could email them and be like, hey, could you actually take down that piece that, <laughs> that I wrote? But I feel, I don't want to do that. Like that feels like, I don't know if I hate it that much. Yeah, I'm sure it's still good. I'd love to listen to it. You'll have to send uh, me um, uh, if, if I can convince you. <laughs> May, we'll see, we'll see. The okay. text, the text was the best part of it. I tried to do, okay. I think the, the reason it kind of fell on its face was I was trying to do, a very minimalism thing. It was like, I'm going to try minimalism for the first time was kind mm -hmm. of the idea. Because I imagine also maybe some non-musicians might listen to music by like Philip Glass and go like, that sounds pretty easy. Like I could, I could probably do that. You know, it's a bunch of the same chord over and over and over again. It's like, it's nothing, it's nothing to it. And I think I kind of had that idea in mind too. We're just like, well, let's repeat this chord a bunch. And then we'll go to the next chord that's slightly different. We'll repeat that a bunch. And one thing I learned from the composition that I, I am grateful for is that writing minimalist music is actually difficult and like actually takes thought and skill and consideration. But I was writing it because I was like, oh, this will be easy. And I'll probably be able to write it quickly for this festival. And then it just didn't sound very good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's like I've always used those opportunities in terms of like music festivals and also just kind of through school, I kind of consider them very safe places to fail musically. And so I tend to try things that I know may not necessarily work. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I'm not trying to impress the other composers at the festival or at the school. I'm going to use it as a learning opportunity. I'm going to try this new thing. And if it, falls on its face then it, then it falls on its face and this one fell on its face of um, course yeah but yeah maybe okay maybe i'll send that your way i don't know <laughs> i can't listen to it I've... i'll bug you about it sometime and... yeah okay great yeah <laughs> nice really excited to hear the all of the songs it'll be cool yeah it's I... it's a lot better than that composition i wrote <laughs> okay I can cool assure people of that it's way better than that so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, I just really appreciate you reaching out. Um, it's nice to be pulled out of the dog life for a little while and talk nice. about something different. So just yeah. living living that dog life. Yeah, really am. Yeah. If you're like Henry and are looking forward to the release of pictures at an inhibition, well, stay tuned for the 30th of April 
when it'll be released on Bandcamp <laughs> and probably also streaming platform stuff too. And yeah, it's a new thing. And thank you very much, Henry, for talking with me this fine afternoon. Yeah, love talking with you, David. Have a nice day. You as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like the tee hee hee. That's good.